Great, thank you very much. Um, hi everyone. Um, first, I'd, I'd like to thank the organizers of the meeting um, for giving me the opportunity to present um, my work here. Um, so I'm, I'm Spiros, I'm a PhD student at the Center for Virus Research up in Glasgow. And today I will be presenting about um, this novel metric I have developed um, for quantifying um, dinucleotide representation. Um, so I'm going to start off um, with explaining why dinucleotides are important um, genomic signatures, especially in viruses, which is what I work on. I'm going to um, go through the maths of the metric. I'm going to um, um, tell you how you can use it in, in the dinuc Python package. And this is going to be mostly about genomic compositions. And then I'm going to go into some um, applications, morphologenetic key uh, applications in SARS-CoV-2 and some of its relatives. Um, so what is a dinucleotide? A dinucleotide is just two nucleotides adjacent to one another um, on the same strand. Um, so if you're going to say a C followed by a G is a CPG dinucleotide, and the P just stands for the phosphodiester bond. And I will be focusing on CPGs for this presentation. There are other interesting dinucleotides too, but this is probably the most um, important overall. So we scientists have seen, have known that um, for a while that the CPGs are much reduced in, in animal genomes. And this has to do with a lot of um, functional things, mutational processes like methylation and um, leading to this um, reduction. Um, but a few years later, scientists um, started um, seeing that this reduction in CPGs is also being mirrored in, the, in many genomes of the viruses infecting these animal hosts. And to give you an example from this um, cool paper from Green Bamatol 2008, um, this is the um, 1918 flu pandemic, so the H1N1 strain. Um, so it, this was caused by a spillover of this virus to humans. And you can see that if you take all the genomes um, for, for this virus across the years, you can see that as the, the virus has been adapting to humans, um, its CPG composition uh, has been dropping. So uh, there's, there's this some importance, some dependency of the host with this genomic signature. And the, the question is, what is the mechanism causing this? And um, so very recently, this uh, paper um, in 2017 found um, this antiviral molecule called ZAP. And um, so this ZAP is part of the um, interferon response, which is essentially the, the first line of defense our cells have against viruses. Um, and what ZAP does is it targets um, CPG-rich um, viral RNA and it degrades it, creating this um, selective pressure against um, CPGs in, in viral genomes. And to give you another example um, with um, flaviviruses this time, um, so flaviviruses are, are viruses that are well known for um, infecting animals through um, invertebrate vectors like mosquitoes or ticks. And, but there are some um, um, flaviviruses that only infect invertebrate hosts, um, for, for example, this, this purple plate here. Um, and if you do a PCA on, on the dinucleotide compositions of these flaviviruses, you see that the, the invertebrate infecting only viruses cluster on their own, and that correlates with their CPG composition. And I'm going to go back to um, this example a bit later on in my presentation. So hopefully now I've at least convinced you that that something is going on with um, CPGs in viruses. Um, and that begs the question, how do we quantify um, this uh, fairly important um, genomic signature? So the traditional way to do that is um, fairly simple. It's most people call this metric the relative dinucleotide abundance. Other people hold, call it different names. Um, but overall, it's just the odds ratio between the frequency of a dinucleotide x, y um, over the product of the frequency of nucleotide x times the frequency of nucleotide y. Um, and although this perfectly works, I was trying to develop a, a, a slightly more complex um, method um, for quantifying the nucleotides that would be tailored specifically um, to coding sequences. And this is um, how I came up with uh, the corrected synonymous dinucleotide usage, the SDU metric. So to, to take you through the maths, um, you would 
calculate the SDUC metric for um, a coding sequence, and you would get three values, one for each frame position of the coding sequence. So these are the nucleotide frame positions. So position one is just the first and second nucleotide of the codon, position two, second and third. And then the bridge position is the last nucleotide of the first codon and the first nucleotide of the, the second codon. And so you, you calculate, this is the formula and you calculate the SDU for uh, dinucleotide J and the frame position A. And to go through this with an example, um, I'll use theranin um, and position two. So theranin has um, four um, synonymous codons and they have four different dinucleotides in their second position, CPU, CPC, CPA, and CPG. If we take CPU as an example and position two, on the numerator here, the, the SDU metric will use a set of amino acids K, which are informative for this dinucleotide in this position. So this means that all these um, four, in this case, amino acids have a synonymous codon that ha can have a CPU in their second position, like here and has an ACU. And then this is the most important bit of the equation where you um, <coughs> make a ratio of the observed um, frequency of for example, in theranin ACUs out of all the synonymous codons, and over, and that's over the expected frequency. So, for this example, let's assume um, uh, synonymous codon usage. Uh, so, equal synonymous codon usage. I'm sorry. So, that would mean that um, your expectation for ACU will be one out of four, um, etc. And then the metric just takes a weighted average um, of all the um, informative amino acids present in the sequence. It's quite easy to explain it for position two. It gets more complicated, especially for the bridge position where you would, instead of um, single amino acids, you'd have pairs. And that would, for example, for CPU bridge, you'd have 90 different uh, amino acid combinations, but that's been taken care of computationally. So what does the metric actually mean? So if for every um, informative amino acid in the K set, O is equal to E, and then the SDU is equal to one. And if it's less than one, there's under-representation of the dinucleotide J. And if it's more than one, there's over-representation. Now you might have noticed that the SDU formula here was missing the C, the corrected bit. And this is because um, we assumed equal synonymous code and usage. But with the corrected SDU, you can essentially adjust the E to an E prime that's adjusted for a single nucleotide composition of the sequence. How do you do that? Well, first you, um, for example, you take um, uh, just an example nucleotide composition. So A.2, G.3, T.3, C.2, and you calculate the expected coding usage um, based on that composition. And then because we're looking at coding sequences, you, the, the stop codons are non-informative. So you need to correct for that. And you just calculate the um, um, stop codon frequencies and, and then make this correction factor, which is just one over one minus the sum of the stop codon frequencies. And then you get your corrected expected codon frequency by um, getting the product of, of the, the expected frequency you had four times the correction factor. And to take you back to our Theranin in um, CPU position two example, you would just calculate the um, uh, E prime value um, by dividing the expected um, frequency, the corrected expected frequency of ACU over the expected, the corrected expected frequencies um, of all the um, um, Theranin synonymous codons. Another cool thing you can do with the SDUC metric is that you can measure the variation around the, the null expectation of the metric. And this gives a sense of um, um, how statistically um, significant your over or under representation is. So first you calculate, this is again a mock coding sequence. So first you calculate the um, SDU for this, and then you translate this sequence. Um, and for each amino acid, you do a weighted random sampling of synonymous codons um, based on the, the corrected expected codon frequency. And um, I showed you how to calculate before. So that gives you um, a number of simulated um, sequences that give the same translation and, and but should abide to the null expectation. And then you calculate the SDU for this. 
And through that, you can get these um, pretty violin plots to visualize it. And you can see that, so the, the dots are the actual SDUC values and the violin plot is the, you know, is the null hypothesis, the null distribution. And um, so you can see, for example, here, you, there's this value is less than one, uh, but it kind of falls within the distribution. So it's not very um, uh, strong uh, underrepresented. And I, I said in the beginning that I'm going to come back to the um, flavivirus example. And um, so here it is. So these are all the um, uh, possible SDU values you can calculate for um, the Aedes flavivirus, which only infects mosquitoes, and the Apoi virus, which is also a flavivirus, but only infects rodents. Um, and if you look closely at the CPG values for all three positions, for the mosquito infecting only um, virus, it, it, they all fall within the, the null distribution. Uh, whereas for the APOI, they are clearly underrepresented for all three positions. I just want to mention here that the, the variation of the null distribution basically depends on the amount of information in the sequence. So the, the longer the coding sequence and um, the tighter the distribution becomes. So it's really easy to use it, the metric, if you want to. So there is this Dynuke package um, I have developed where you, it's, it's very straightforward. So you give it a FASTA file, you give it um, a list of the dinucleotides you want to calculate um, your SDU for, give it a list of positions, by default it's just all positions. This little boots option um, is if, if you want to calculate the null um, distribution, just like I showed you, um, you would just give it a number of permutations to do that for. And um, the more the better, but it just takes a bit more time. And you can also, instead of um, using the, the single nucleotide composition of your sequence, which is the default, you can also um, have your own custom nucleotide uh, composition expectation for the metric. And the package can also calculate a few other um, things like the RDA, some code and usage metrics and some variations I don't have time to go into um, now. Um, so there's, it, it can have a few different uh, functions. So lastly, I wanna go through an example of using the SDU um, for SARS-CoV-2. So we've been doing uh, some, some work with SARS-CoV-2 and, and its phylogenetics and, and its relative um, it, it's re related viruses. So this is this is the um, genome of, of SARS-CoV-2, just a schematic. It's about 30 kb long. Um, and the problem with these viruses is that the coronaviruses recombine a lot. So to do proper phylogenetics, you really need to split this um, the, your alignment up into putatively non-recombinant regions. So for this example, we're going to take this about 10 kb long um, region which is all, all coding. Um, and this produces this phylogeny here, which, so you can see this branch, this clade, sorry, um, includes SARS-CoV-2 and a couple of um, its close relatives. Uh, you can see that this clade is pretty undersampled. And then uh, this, this is just an out group, and this clade is where the SARS-CoV virus is on, um, which is the, the, the agent that caused the um, 2002 SARS epidemic. Um, and then if you calculate the SDUC values for CPG for all these viruses, we notice that um, the, the relatives of SARS-CoV-2 that cluster in this clade are noticeably, have noticeably less CPG for all three positions overall compared to the other SARS-like viruses. And then with the help of um, Philippe Lemay, we were able to use this um, really cool method called um, phylogenetic EM, where you can give the phylogeny, you can fit the, 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 the SDUC values for each position as quantitative traits onto the tips of the phylogeny, and then in fair adaptive shifts um, that may have happened in, in the internal branches um, on, on this quantitative trait. So you can see here that we were basically able to pick up that the most internal branch of the clade SARS-CoV-2 emerged from um, has actual evidence of an adaptive shift towards a reduction of its CPG levels. And this could um, be attributed to either a, a host change, which might be a bit unlikely, or um, it could be 
um, uh, change in, in tissue tropism. Um, so, right, so to finish off, um, I've shown you how um, we've used the, um, the SDU for fitting it into as a trait into phylogeny and, and, and monitoring adaptive shifts. Um, but I really want to open the floor to discussion here and, and get some feedback from everyone. Because um, now I'm, I'm trying, I'm essentially trying to use, um, to essentially fit the, this dinucleotide bias into um, in the nucleotide representation into substitution models and more formally um, assess how these changes might happen um, nucleotide substitution by nucleotide substitution um, in the um, in, in proper phylogenetic methods. So yeah, like any any feedback and any discussion would be great. And then I would like to acknowledge uh, my supervisors, Joseph Hughes and David Robertson, and everyone I work with at the CVR and the Robertson Lab and the Wilson Lab. And I want to thank everyone involved in um, this paper where we described this um, adaptive shift in CPGs in SARS-CoV-2 and its relatives. And it also has some really cool um, selection analysis, both in, in SARS-CoV-2 and in the related viruses. Um, Oscar McLean, Philippe LeMay, and Sergey Pond, among others. And I want to thank you for your attention as well. And yeah, I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs>